welcome everybody to our panel or interview panel, however you want to describe it, about uh, founders, lessons. We all know we're in the crypto winter that is hopefully soon becoming a, a crypto spring and then a crypto summer and the cycle uh, goes to the next phase. Uh, but we want to talk with uh, my two distinguished panelists here about lessons learned, uh, not only in the crypto winter, but of course in their professional lives. Let me introduce myself quickly. My name is Sebastian Becker. I work as a consultant with my company, The Brain Behind. I'm also board of uh, directors of INATBA, the European uh, Blockchain Industry Lobby Organization. I work with the German Bundesblock. So that means we represent lots of startups uh, nationally and internationally. So hopefully uh, I'm, I'm a good moderator today with this. And we have Christoph Ivaniec here working as an advisor and very well known in the German crypto landscape as uh, ex-CFO of uh, Nuri. Uh, Christoph has a banking background and uh, Florian Reike from Peanuts uh, also has a background as investor uh, and now again founder. So happy to have you here and let's maybe start with a quick round of intros. Christoph. Yeah, m many thanks Sebastian. Great to be here with you all. Um, I have I worked 10 years in traditional banking. You mentioned that um, I moved to Berlin, um, became kind of late founder, so I'm not a real early founder of, of that, that time. Bitwala uh, joined the company, three founders, 15 employees, and a dog uh, stage. But I'm a CFO, and that's completely normal. Typically, in the first days, you need to work on the product, you need to work on the tech, and with the customers. So, like a, a finance guy like me, it's totally okay to bring later on board. A lot of young startups are asking me that: um, when should we hire our head of finance or something? Rather later. Um, concentrate on the product uh, first. So. Again, moved to Berlin, worked five years with Bitwala, trying to build a crypto neobank. Um, we failed last year. That's what we will be talking about on this panel. Um, we went out of the market. We winded down the company. We rebranded it before to Nuri, so maybe you have heard that name. Um, and end of December, I closed the door, and I took the last notebooks and drove them to the insolvency administrator. And so. The, the, the CFO go, is the last who goes off board, I would say, in, in startup business. And uh, since beginning of the year, I'm doing some consultancy, some advisory, but um, I'm a very passionate person, so I'm pretty sure that I will end up in a full-time, uh, very deep um, in, in work role in, uh, in a venture soon. Yeah? Florian, please, go ahead. Yeah, uh, great to be here. Uh, so about myself, I worked in the blockchain space for about like 10-ish years. Initially mostly like trading, then like early stage uh, investment stuff, community management, etc. In 2017, I co-founded Advanced Blockchain AG in Berlin, which yeah, basically incubates and invests in blockchain projects from like 2017 to 2020, mostly blockchain for industry, like supply chain, IoT, etc. projects, and from then on out mostly uh, in the DeFi space. Um, yeah, over, th like, uh, over the time we saw like a lot of startups, uh, learned a lot from what they do, from what we've been doing, and um, when the market went down, um, about like 12, 18 months ago, our investors advised us to maybe step on the investing side um, and like um, not build as much stuff anymore. So at this point, I was thinking, um, do I really like need to sit around and just wait for the market to turn up again? And uh, yeah, then I co-founded Peanuts, which is focused on like banking for crypto startups since that was always a problem with lots of our portfolio companies. Okay, thanks for the summary. Quick question to you in the audience. Who is a founder or part of a startup? That's the minority, bit of a surprise, but I, I guess most of you have been in part of a startup, right? Okay, so we heard a few lessons learned already from, from Christoph and also from Florian, but there seems to be a slight contradiction. You are setting up a let's say, a neobank, if you want, end-to-end. -end. Uh, you just lost one. Uh, so where are we if we talk about fintech 
Um, we still lack infrastructure. I think your point was very well made. We still need classical banking services for crypto startups, for example, and we still need to see that end-to-end -end flow of digital assets seamlessly and regulatory compliant. Um, could you say that you were too early? Because when we uh, talked yesterday, it's typically easy to reach consensus. What does a startup need? A great team, timing, uh, and then focus, 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 uh, typically. Yeah. So was it just the timing, or uh, what's the lesson for you? What didn't work in the past five years for yourself, but also in the industry? I totally agree, Sebastian, on, on the three things. This would also be the things we, I guess, at the end of this, would be summarizing this panel again. Team, timing, and focus. But we started like with talking about timing because we both kind of built crypto banking, a little bit more SME focused, we did retail, and yes, we have been too early. And typically I would say, if you can be too late or too, uh, too, too early as a startup, it's always better to be too early and wait for until the market is coming. Unfortunately, fintech and banking is a very capital intensive business. And the problem with being too early is, that is the right strategy if you can get it funded or you can run it very cost efficiently and just wait with a small team, tinkering on the solution. You know that there is a breakthrough coming, you are there, then everybody, every customer will need to use it. That is a lot of like founder talks of very successful startups like the Airbnbs of the world. They will tell you there was something happening in the space and their product was just there and from one day to the other they were overrun could scale and were then basically placing themselves in their niche and uh, and um, being successful there. So we were too early um, and the problem, so two things, first of all we were too early because in 2017-18 a lot of the really nice solutions you can use these days to build a lean um, banking solution, embedded banking, was not there yet. There were no virtual EI bands, so we needed to build on a real bank account for every single customer. Like, this is cost intensive, we needed to do it in Germany, there was very few offshore possibilities to do it, Germany is regulatory-wise just more heavy, and um, so unfortunately, also uh, crypto regulation at the time was still, like 2017, 18, six years ago, Germany was at least a country in which you could be certain what BaFin is thinking about it, but you, it was very conservative. But at least you had the security of planning where do you set it up. In other countries, there was just no regime yet. But with MICA, we have now the clarity of a regime European-wide, so you can make use of that in a Euro trans-European case. So it's a little bit unfortunate, but um, to, to answer the question from the other side, yes, timing, but on the other side, it was just so expensive to run this that we couldn't hold out until now. All of these things have cleared up. And it's a little bit unfortunate, but I can later um, elaborate on some other issues which might play into that direction and what we learned from it. Yeah, I would agree that like uh, the timing there is like really important and probably better to be early. Um, we also had like phases where, for example, if the market goes up really fast, it's probably good to be spending a lot of money and scaling fast, but then also when it goes down, the opposite applies. So we were in both phases and now really sticking to like the lean building approach, um, which yeah. also I think now is like a good time with Mika bringing in more clarity on the regulation side, like allowing all the startups to stay here instead of going to like Hong Kong or St. Lucia or Dubai, and also um, making the investment climate a lot better, um, which is nice because it kind of sucks in the US now, so <laughs> good that it comes over here. But, but here I, I guess you mean Europe, because you also have yeah. a kind of a distributed setup, you can talk about that if you want, but also coming back to what Christoph said, and we heard it in the panel before, regulatory arbitrage. Um, you decided to, to set business up in Germany, and yesterday you said something like, hmm, not so sure if I would do this again. But uh, was this period of, let's say, unclear regulatory status across Europe also leaving too much wiggle room for the national regulators? Is the Mika regime now also creating a much uh, narrower path for them? Is, will this be helpful going forward? Yeah, I mean, the MICA has two huge advantages. It decreases, as you're saying, like the interpretation room for single regulators in the, in the EEA and in Europe. 
and therefore reduces regulatory arbitrage. It should, actually, it should lead into that direction. And it creates really planning security for a European-wide uh, product. And let's face it, if we talk about a tech product, we want to scale, we need to scale. Um, and just a single European market, even the bigger French, German markets, are in international comparison still small markets. If we talk about a retail solution, like ours have been, you need actually the typical millions of customers. That's the number you need to talk about, like to cover the fixed costs, to get like VCs actually looking up from their desk on a, 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 and, and considering you as, as, as a case. And um, so that it's harmonized Europe, that you can roll out with the security of planning throughout the different countries, that your, your, that your licensing setup is holding true also in France, that is a really great step forward. Um, I would have appreciated if that would have been the clarity we would have faced in 2017. And our thinking at the time was to stay in Germany because there was this planning security, at least for the German-speaking market. But the second topic also was signaling. 2017 and 18 was a crazy time. Like we had FTX last year, but 17, 18 trust was a huge issue. And like to be really visible, having an office in Berlin, being in the press, being tangible, and having like a German flag on your homepage, that actually led that uh, to the point where interesting customers, the ones who have like a significant amount and want to use your solution in a meaningful way, we could attract them in the early days. So there was a certain virality in the early days of making the choice to be in the more conservative, but at least clear German market. But at the later stage, it just led to a lot of additional costs because the German regulator, in comparison to our competitors, was applying way more um, yeah, less progressive stance or like more conservative one. Let's talk quickly about uh, use cases because, of course, the, the neo banking use case is not a native crypto use case necessarily. The market was already quite crowded uh, in the traditional banking space with neo banks. So, was this also a problem of crowded markets or was it more the, the question of regulatory uncertainty and non established uh, processes, etc.? And let alone the, the too early for. Uh, let's say blockchain um, maturity. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a question a lot of investors obviously always ask. Yeah, it's like a very crowded um, market, but banking is just such a big market, and there's always like these two things which go along, right? How big is the overall market size, and how strong is competition? I would say generally there was enough room to grow for a neo bank in the crypto space, or like a gen and even like a neo bank without crypto still has room to grow. It's just very expensive. Customer acquisition costs in banking are extremely expensive upfront. That is like the cash needs and the fundraising needs in the early days. But banking is also a very, very sticky product, which customers typically use for rather decades than years. So, and, and this is like obviously with a discount factor um, of, of that future potential earnings. In a low interest rate environment, fundraising for neo banks is easier, but that is exactly what we experienced last year. If as soon as rates jump up, then the discounting of future revenues become, becomes very, very different, and then fundraising becomes really, really hard for a long term, lo long outlook, long stickiness of customers, but a lot of the revenues lying in the future thing where you need to spend a lot today. And let's talk quickly about teams, because, you know, it's, ob it's an obvious one. Typically, you say 50, 60 percent of a startup investment are based on the team setup, uh, qualification of the team, experience of the team, um, you know, how they work with the outside world. And by definition, the blockchain space with, you know, aspects like decentralization, et cetera, is more of a team sport compared to, to let's say, traditional disciplines. Is this something that has been a bit neglected in, in our space? Because, of course, also the hype cycles were, you know, leading to a lot of companies that were just surfing waves and, and they were, you know, potentially successful if they could just surf the wave. They didn't have to, to build the ecosystem, but the technology requires it. Um, so what can be learned for, let's say, the next round of startups and, and, and founders? How would you see this ecosystem build up? We see it on the technical side, of course. You know, developers are a crucial, not only, uh, you know, co-workers, but also a resource in that space. And we have to, you know, create communities around them. But what about the founders? What can we say about uh, founding as a team sport in, in the blockchain space? Well, I feel like it's a lot easier to like get together the team, meet people, because there's like lots of meetups, conferences, 
Discord, Telegram groups to get to know each other. Also, it's like much easier to work collaboratively on like projects and new products. Um, but yeah, as you said, in the end, the team is the most important thing. And if it falls apart, it's uh, definitely not good. And so I guess your co-founders at Peanuts, you, you know them for quite some years now? Mm, or is it a new team that just formed up in a meetup somewhere? Actually, recently. it's a relatively new team that formed up in a meetup. Um, we okay. met at, a, at another conference um, about a year ago, and basically we all had the same problem with banking. Um, so we thought, let's get together and work on it. What, is, what should your next team have, Christoph? You said you might most likely end up as a passionate CFO in a team again. Yeah. So what would, what would be on your wish list? It's a good question. Um, stability is the answer, because um, so we talked about that focus, team, and and timing. So let's let's dig down a little bit on the team side. The right founder setup is super important culturally, purpose-wise. To up from that starting point, the small group to build a really dedicated, smart, high-performing team. This is the, the nucleus you need to have in place. And the second thing I want to say about it is stability of that group is also very important. So at, at Bidwala Nuri, we had unfortunately some changes in this group, like founder, C-level, and actually a serious number. Like um, with me, there was like three CEOs in the five years, and all of them have been great, and our team composition with each other was great. So typically what can happen in, in these um, instances in which team change uh, happens, typically can blow up. So this is the actual team risk, what also VCs are fearing, that everything blows up, people get like uh, in fights about their shares and the rights, and whatever, and how somebody goes out, and it becomes personal. Didn't happen at all. So from day one until last day, we had like an amazing founder team, or like C-level team. We are still meeting for dinners, and sitting on Wednesday nights until half past one in, in Kreuzberg and bars. So this is amazing culturally, but we still had change. And change means you need to find new great people for this group. You are distracted. We searched for a CPO for a year. I had like perhaps 30 calls like to really assess new candidates. Are they a team fit? Are they an expertise fit? And that just drains the very, very important focus out of you, which, which we didn't touch yet for fully, but focus should have the product, scaling the company, and not rehiring for your C-level group. And that is one of the problems which comes with this change in, in, the, in the group, which might happen. People have different life circumstances and things are happening. So besides having the right people, my point would be, you also need to be a little bit lucky that they stick around for five to 10 years, even more perhaps, and I feel comfortable with that. Let's quickly change to the non-financial side of, of our markets or more the industrial side. You know, we've seen a wave of uh, POCs and MVPs in, in the last cycle, you know, 2017, 18. Basically, every big uh, company in the DAX uh, and also, of course, internationally had a blockchain research team. Oftentimes, they were just startups or project teams within a corporate and didn't really have a, uh, let's say, an innovation or blockchain strategy that was uh, approved by the board. Uh, so in the end, many of these initiatives uh, were not leading anywhere. Uh, now we have Mika and we have, uh, let's say, legal certainty for utility tokens. And uh, this hopefully will give uh, legal teams and also the CFO teams, uh, the treasury of big corporates, more clarity about what could and should be done. Can we expect something there? So is timing good for for industrial use? Because we always say, well, the speculation part, you can, you know, see it like this and see it like that, but uh, the worth of the technology is basically, nobody is really uh, doubting it, uh, but we haven't seen major rollouts. Mm, I don't know if it depends so much on Mika with like tokens and everything and more on, like simply adoption and like digitalization. Um, we had that in the past where we worked on a project for like um, a while, like one and a half years to basically connect different machines with like a big company in Germany. And we worked on it, we worked on it, we were given like some cloud, but in the end, some project manager told us, well, yeah, actually 90% of the machines are not even, like they can't even connect to the internet. And <laughs> so the use case was kind of dead in its track. So I feel like blockchain for industry um, also like, 
it's not as much about regulation, more about like digitalization in parts. But we saw it in the financial space. Regulation is, of course, uh, accelerating things. You know, as soon as you needed uh, crypto custody and regulated ones, of course, everybody had to get one. So there was a boom for 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 um, custody providers. And now we have, for example, incoming regulation in the ESG, ESG space. And of course, we know that blockchain has the capability to be a perfect registry, transparency, uh, immutability, etc. So is is regulation still going to set the pace a little bit for, for innovation and founders? Would you say with your experiences that a regulated space is better than, let's say, a totally open Wild West uh, space? What, what's your personal feeling here? I think the regulation like needs to be logical. Like, um, for example, I think Europe with Mika is taking a like healthy approach, whereas for example in the US it feels kind of like just like smash all. <laughs> Gensler against the yeah. rest, yeah, okay. Mm. Christoph, what's, what's your take? Yeah, I think I mentioned that before, like planning security is so important because if you want to build some really a significant new venture, like something really successful, really like everybody wants like the million customers, the really big thing, uh, you need significant investors and, 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 and uh, serious money. And that only will happen if there's a certain a certainty over planning cycles of five, 10, 15 years. So everything about regulatory uncertainty and that basically is when there is no regulation. You could say, ah, oh, it's regulatory out, it's, it's great. No, I, I would argue against it. It's not great if it's, if it's not cleared out. So again, Europe, we heard that in the talk before, Mika, really good approach. Better having a little bit, um, a regulation in place, not everybody's 100% happy because yes, there obviously are things we need um, to, to see as guidelines and may prohibit one or the other use case, but at least all of the others, you're certain that they are viable, they will be still around in 10 years, and you can build a successful business on top of that. Okay, then let's wrap up personal statements from all the three of us, looking a bit into the future, what will be key? Uh, I think there's still a lot to be done. Uh, you know, I like to imagine blockchain as a Swiss army knife. We have maybe used the knife a little bit and the scissors, but not a lot of the rest. So uh, I think orchestration will be the challenge. That's basically true for every sector, even in the fintech space, if you want to run things more efficiently. Uh, it's not so much about the Lego building blocks, it's about orchestrating them perfectly well. Um, so that's what, what I'm personally looking for. I also think that incoming regulation especially in the ESG se sector, will drive a lot of blockchain adoption, hopefully. Uh, and uh, I also hope that blockchains next year will be great and uh, a lot bigger than today. So good luck with that. Uh, Florian, final words? Um, yeah, overall very positive on the space. Um, generally, um, I'm really looking forward to like the connection of fintech and blockchain because, um, well, the, Everybody builds like the coolest newest DeFi product, but I think this part is often overlooked to be able to like easily onboard new users, big or small, uh, to just be able to easily enter and exit out of the like ecosystem and make it more seamless connecting the web to web three. Yeah. My final thoughts. Um Blockchain solve a trust problem. So it's sometimes hard to see in uh, economies in which there's a lot of trust in the institutions, why this actually, you should do this de decentralized ledger, it's lower, it costs more, whatever. But we are in a privileged situation here in Germany, in Europe, there's countries in which that really solves an issue because these institutions are not there. And the outlook um, I'm personally having is that unfortunately there is less trust in, and perhaps um, there are reasons for that in also in our ec um, more like developed economies for major institutions like central banks, like politi political institutions. So the blockchain is here to stay for a good reason and we should always keep that in mind that censorship resistance and uh, permissionless transactions will also potentially in our lives in developed countries be way more meaningful in the future. So. Let's keep, uh, keep the space going. Okay, thanks a lot for listening in. Uh, give an applause uh, for the panelists here.